Hello everyone, it uh, seems that Captain Foley um, hasn't uh, shown up. Oh, he's up there, hasn't shown up yet. So it's just us for now. Uh, but I don't know what to say, as the captain that usually um, intros the topic of today's episode. Oh man. Ooh. Hey Commander. Oh, nice hey guys. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little late. Uh, been out and about doing some running around and things. Just got back. Started the party without me, I see. Hey, it's not like I had a choice. You were late. Pretty late. Uh, uh-huh. No choice, huh? Last time I checked, these episodes were not filmed live, Samuel. <laughs> Keep in mind that you wrote this entire script, so you can't blame me for blaming you for running around. It's in the script. And it's the skit after all, isn't it? So no blame. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was our super awesome introduction to the Danube class runabout. Measuring in with a length of 23.1 meters, width of 13.7, and height of 5.4, this ship has a mass of 158.7 metric tons. This type of vessel is smaller than a starship, but larger than a shuttlecraft. They're typically equipped with transporters and a variety of sensors, and offered additional living space and the ability to be configured for mission specific cargo capacities. Everything a starship has, just a small package. They had a larger operational range and weapons capacities than standard shuttles and were capable of speeds of up to warp 5. Runabouts were typically assigned to space stations or starships as auxiliary craft, usually acting as a rapid response scientific expedition transport, orbital or landed base for scientific or research missions, or even as a tactical emergency mission support craft. This design was actually inspired by the older SD-103 space dock ferry type craft as seen shuttling the crew of the Enterprise in Star Trek VI and Discover Country. In the Star Trek Encyclopedia, Michael and Denise Akuta speculate that the Sydney-class transport, the one that Montgomery Scott is rescued from in TNG, uh, the episode Relics, may have in fact been, in-universe, the early runabout. Uh, the development of the Danube-class runabouts began in 2363, and the first prototype, the USS Danube, NX-72003, was completed in 2365. It was designed to be a rapid response vehicle suitable for a number of common tasks, including scientific resupply, intelligence gathering, and personnel transfer missions for use in situations that demanded a vessel more capable than a standard shuttlecraft, but a lower profile than a full-size starship. With this flexibility, a runabout could be utilized as a long-range personnel and cargo transport, an agile mobile weapons platform, or a high-speed reconnaissance vehicle. The Utopia Polynesia Fleet Yard served as the primary Danube class construction facility with three other sites set up to continue production of the class and spare parts for existing vehicles after the first production run was finished at Utopia Polynesia. By the late 2370s, the Advanced Starship Design Bureau was developing successes for this class while Starfleet continued to build more and more of this very successful class. The Danube class of runabouts entered into service in late 2368, with three being assigned to Deep Space Nine. These first three runabouts were delivered to Deep Space Nine aboard the USS Enterprise 1701D and consisted of the USS Rio Grande, USS Yangtze Kang, and the USS Ganges, although the Star Trek magazine of July 2002 also claims that the USS Mekong was among the first of the three runabouts delivered to Deep Space Nine, although it was actually sent in later to replace the destroyed USS Ganges. So, however, issue number two of June 1999 has the correct information on the runabouts. We scour all of our resources here and get you the correct facts, guys. Anyways, regardless of that, the first three were delivered in early 2369, and these DS9 runabouts were all named after rivers found on Earth. Generally manned by a two to four person crew, they were initially used to explore the Gamma Quadrant. These early missions would usually consist of a relatively brief journey into the Quadrant, and two to four people could then survive quite comfortably for several weeks if these missions needed such a length. Um, the aft section of the ship contains living quarters and a small common area with a meeting or dining room table. Uh, there's a food replicator, but the ship also carries emergency rations should the system fail. And it, since it's Star Trek, they do fail if the story needs it to fail. <laughs> small bunks line the port and starboard bulkheads flanking the exit leading to the cockpit, and a small library computer console with a chair is tucked into one corner. The ship is capable of accommodating up to 40 personnel though in the evacuation situation. While docked at Deep Space Nine, these craft were housed in any of the six landing bays situated around the habitat ring. They are launched and landed using an elevator receiving platform. Tractor beams help guide the ship onto the pad. Then when the platform is lowered, an airlock attaches to the side of the ship to allow the crew to board or debark from the vehicle. 
Uh, doors would also slide shut over top of the craft to allow the compartment to be pressurized so that a service crew could maintain or repair the craft as needed. Upon launch, the doors would slide open, the platform would raise, and the ship could depart. Recommended yard overhaul for the runabouts was every 15 months, but I'm sure they got more regular maintenance than that. These craft are normally only lightly armed. In standard form, the runabouts are equipped with six Type 4 culminated phaser arrays with two mounted forward, two on themselves, and two facing aft. To increase their firepower, a runabout could be fitted with roll bar torpedo launchers similar to the Miranda class, and this comes equipped with full-size photon or quantum torpedoes. Uh, the vessel can also be upgraded with a further two extendable MK-25 direct fire micro torpedo launchers just below the cockpit. Micro torpedoes are just 13.3 centimeters in length and can be equipped with a variety of explosives. The micro torpedo launcher can also be used to deploy sensor probes. The standard complement of micro torpedoes is generally around 24. Speaking of that roll bar, this was an extra piece of equipment that could be easily fitted onto the runabout. Uh, there were several variations, with the primary variant being an enhanced sensor package that increased the runabout's effectiveness in scientific missions with its more advanced and precise sensors. It could also be used as a torpedo pod, as we already mentioned, uh, or as a cargo pod that allowed the ship to carry a few more supplies if the mission called for it. Behind the scenes, the roll bar was in fact added to some scenes so that the audience could differentiate which ship was which, since it's rare, if not unheard of, to have two identical hero ships in any given scene. So the roll bar was added to, and actually allowed the audience to know easily who was in which ship. Which, you now, I, 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 when I wrote this, I thought, well, is there a single scene when we see two identical hero ships? Obviously, discluding you know the DS9 battles, because the, the only was, hero yeah. ship there is the Defiant, and there's pretty much only one Defiant in those battles. I can't think of a single scene. I don't think so, no. So, yeah, good, good idea, guys. The midsection of the ship contained a detachable module that could be changed for different mission profiles. As a result, it could carry scientific labs, medical facilities, defensive or cargo payloads, depending on the assignment it was undertaking. One of this design's most groundbreaking features was also its most useful, and that was the compact warp reactor. This was located in the spine along the top of the ship. It is a horizontally mounted reactor with a deuterium tank located at one end of the spine and the anti-deuterium tank located at the other end. A small Jeffries tube is located alongside the warp core so that the crew can carry out any necessary maintenance or repairs as needed. Despite its small size, it was still capable of propelling the ship to speeds as high as warp 5. Uh, the impulse engines were located on each side of the craft behind the pylons that connect the warp core to the nacelles. The main computer core of the ship was located underneath the floor of the cockpit and it used an M15 Isolinear 3 processor. So hopefully 10 times better than the M5 computer processor that in, in yeah. TOS because there are a lot of kinks in the M5. Yeah, there were a lot of problems. Hopefully they've upgraded it since then and That's yeah, made it much better. <laughs> much better. Um, and this measures in at 2.3 by 2.1 by 1.3 meters and had a total of 186 isolinear banks and 53 command pre-processors. Removal of just one of these chips can lead to a collapse in the warp core containment field within 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, hold on for a sec. Don't you think that's a bit of a design flaw? Yes. Um, it's one of, the, one of the facts I uncovered while I was doing the research, and I didn't know if I should include it, but I kind of yeah. figured that it was mentioned in an episode. Yeah. I thought it was important enough to put in, but one chip being removed and you have a warp core containment field breach within 10 seconds does and, not sound safe. I mean, fundamentally, you take this one chip away. Did, did you just take a chip out? I, I'm going to put it back. Um, <laughs> and put it back. No, no, it's, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't yeah. do that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Well, I would assume if you need to access the isolated chips to do any repairs, you would need to shut down the warp core first. Yeah, that's a really good, really good idea. But you would think you'd want at least two or three, you know, just backup contingency. You know, what if one shatters or one cracks in warp? Anyway, um, the control and navigation of the runabout can be given over to the autopilot, which is controlled by the said computer core, um, but of course can also be set by voice command, but this requires an authorization code from a Starfleet officer. The cockpit of these ships had primary flight controls that were duplicated at the two forward stations. However, the normal configuration was to have the port or left station set as the mission commander's controls, and the starboard or right station set as the pilot's controls. The main navigation control system is a RAV ISHEC Mod 3 Warp Celestial Guidance System, only the best, yep, <laughs> and is located in the middle console between the two seats. If there was only a crew of two, all the tactical and engineering controls could in fact be transferred to these forward foremost stations, 
Um, however, with a crew of four, the two control stations located at either side of the cockpit assume the responsibilities of tactical on the left side and engineering on the right. In an emergency situation, the main cockpit can in fact detach from the main bulk of the ship and can either continue to carry on in space in some very lifeboaty configuration or land on a planet's surface. The entire ship can obviously also land or take off on planetary surfaces as it was fitted with vertical lift vents under the winglets. Another benefit of the runabout was dedicated transporter pads. Mm. This was a short-range transporter system that was capable of beaming crew members down to the planet's surface from orbit. In the early versions, this transporter was located in an open archway in the middle of the cockpit area, occupying the space behind the control positions at the very rear of the cockpit. Mm. This version was open at the front and the rear, and it was necessary to step over a low-laying bulkhead to gain entry. Mm. Now, this, of course, if you watched our technology episode on the transporters, was to provide static discharge or other contamination from drifting onto the transporter pads. Yeah, and main transport rooms often uh, had at least one or two steps on a normal Starship to solve this problem. And later models of the design, however, uh, implemented around 2373, the transporter was moved to a room adjacent to the main cockpit area. This, of course, provided more room in the main, in the main cockpit. The runabouts have standard Starfleet life support systems that normally provide a Class M environment, but can also be adapted for life forms from Class H, K, or L-type worlds. A fact file or technology about planetary classifications seems to be in our future, Samuel, as it's really interesting stuff, actually. If a crew member becomes injured or environmental systems fail, the runabouts are equipped with several emergency systems, including medical kits, four EVA spacesuits, and a number of hand phasers. The exterior of the craft featured an aft tractor beam emitter, which was in fact powerful enough to tow at least a large Cardassian Galore warship. Uh, That's wow. Yeah. That, yep. Bit, bit much, possibly, guys. I think, I think, yeah. Uh, this is also capable of being rigged to tow at warp velocities as well. In an alternate timeline, the Yellowstone-class upgrade to the runabout were introduced in 2371 with an enhanced Tetrion plasma warp nacelles. And while we don't know how much of an upgrade this truly was, I wouldn't be surprised if we could give the runabout a decent warp 8. The Yellowstone-class is also featured in Star Trek Online. Uh, but this new version of the runabout is more advanced and well-equipped than its predecessor and has the latest tech from 2409. She's equipped with phasers and full-sized photon torpedoes mm. as default. Gone are the micro-torpedoes, given their lack of punch, which is needed given the unstable mm. political climate of 2409. And this is quite an interesting design, although I think it looks a bit too just sort of generic sci-fi to me. Like there's added shapes and, and, and things to the basic shape of the runabout. And while I do approve it overall, um, it's not my favourite looking design ship. Um, what do you think of the 2409 version? Uh, I think it looks really cool. Yeah. Um, it looks... Yeah. Yeah, I like it a lot, actually, to be honest. But I agree, it's more of a general sci-fi design than actual Star Trek. Unless we're talking about um, a design for a fighter, maybe. Um, okay. And then I very very much approve of this design for a Star, Star, a Star Trek ship. I think that works because of the sleekness of, of the new design plus... Mm -hmm. You know the the full torpedo launches, like you said. So I think it, you know, Paragon quite a good fighter, but it's not obviously got lot, not got the long range or runabout. So I can definitely see it being merged. And yeah, that that, that works for me. I like it. Yeah. Now for some information specific to individual runabouts we saw on screen. Mm. Let's start with the USS Ganges NCC seven two four five four. This was one of the original three ships delivered to Deep Space Nine. It was named after the Ganges River in northern India and eastern Pakistan and was first seen in the episode Past Prologue. Next up is the USS Mekong, NCC-72617. This ship was assigned to Deep Space Nine to replace the USS Ganges after she was destroyed in 2370, and not part of the original three <laughs> that were delivered. Uh, the Mekong was named for a river in Southeast Asia, which flows south to the China Sea, and made her first appearance in the episode Playing God. The USS Orinoco, NCC-72905, was first seen in the DS9 episode The Siege, and entered service aboard DS9 in 2370, and was named after the 1,700-mile-long Orinoco River in Venezuela. Next up is the USS Yukon, NCC-74602, named for the Yukon River in North America. This was first seen in the episode Songs of Moog. And now for another of the original three runabouts delivered to DS9 was the USS Yangtze Keen, NCC-72453, named after a river in China, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the ship was first seen in the episode Emissary, the pilot, and was destroyed in the Gamma Quadrant. 
the USS Rio Grande is next and is probably the most famous of the Deep Space Nine runabouts. It was the first runabout to enter the wormhole. Uh, the ship's registry number is NCC-72452, and it was first seen in the episode The Emissary, named after a river on the North American continent. In fact, I think this was the only runabout to never get destroyed, actually, throughout the entire series, so it's got that claim to fame. Uh, the USS Rubicon, NCC-72936, is next. First seen in Family Business, this was the replacement for the destroyed USS Mekong and is named for the Italian River that was of strategic importance to Caesar in 49 BC. And finally, the USS Volga, NCC 73196. She was first seen in the episode entitled Body Parts. Don't remember that one. Um, and was named for the Volga River in the east of Earth's European continent. And yes, Stuart, the Rio Grande was the only one to survive all seasons of DS9. Well done, one survived. Um, a total of seven named and three unnamed runabouts were destroyed over the course of the show. <laughs> so many destroyed runabouts. Um, and at one point, Major Kira makes a comment about this and says, You know, the rate we're going through runabouts, it's a good thing that Earth has so many rivers. She is not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, eh? Okay, so let's move on to the behind the scenes now. So the runabout was designed by our good friend Rick Sternbach and the Defiant designer, Jim Martin. Mm. The interior cockpit set was designed by Joseph Hodges. Uh, all under the direction of Herman Zimmerman. The aft compartment, as seen in the TNG episode Timescape, was designed by Richard James, and the ship's miniature was built by Tony Menninger. That sounds like a hell of a collaboration there. Everyone designed little things. That's yeah, know, pretty cool. According to Rick Sternbuck, the studio model for the aforementioned Sydney class, first seen in the TNG episode Relics, was to have become the basis for the DS9 runabout um, before a new design was ordered. Good, glad they did. Uh, however, the SD-103 also played a major role as a design influence. The model for the SD-103 actually became USS Janolan, the Sydney-class ship Sydney Relics. Actually, the Janolan, uh, the Sydney-class, is actually one of my favourite Star Trek ships. And as a bit of bonus trivia, it is also seen in Trials and Tribulations when it was delivering the temporal investigators to Deep Space Nine. <laughs> so, That's look out cool. for that. But let's get back to the runabout for now. Uh, Sternbach presented the producers with a few versions of the ship for their mm. approval, some with underslung nacelles, others with very wing-like wraparound engine designs. And you can in fact see some of these similarities to both the Delta Flyer as well as the Defiance final designs in some of these early sketches. Um, very interesting concept art. The original filming model of the runabout was built by Tony Menninger's Brazil Fabrication Model Shop and filmed at visual effects company Image G. The model was approximately 18 inches long and featured internal lighting for the interior as well as the impulse and uh, warp nacelles. A large miniature of Deep Space Nine's docking bay uh, featuring a slide away roof and a hydraulic landing pad were built to the same scale as the runabout herself. The original studio model of the runabout, now designated the USS Rubicon, was sold at the Christie's 40 Years of Star Trek The Collection auction for $33,600. Nice. And it's kind of, we, we've, we've quoted Christie's for a long time now. 40 years, that's that's 10 years ago now. I know, I was writing that and I thought, my God, it's been 10 years since that already? It just doesn't seem like it. Time flies. The initial interior cockpit was constructed over a nine week period and was changed and overhauled going into season three. Another redesign occurred between season four and five with the transporter being relocated into its own room. The set was also redressed a number of times to serve as other vessels, including the Marquis Raider, some Mirror Universe ships, and was also the shuttle from the Enterprise E, as seen in the Star Trek film Insurrection, I believe it was a Type 11 ship. Yeah, I think so. Uh, the set for the Renabout's living quarters that was built for the episode Timescape was designed by Richard James and was funded from the Next Generation's budget to take some of the pressure off of Deep Space Nine's finances. Unlike the cockpit's construction, the design, fabrication, and completion of this set came off in just nine days. Wow. So not, not nine weeks. <laughs> Although I guess there's not a bajillion LED L cars displays. That's a good point, actually, yeah. <laughs> this was the only appearance of the Danube class outside of Deep Space Nine. Although, obviously, we saw the very similar Yellowstone in Voyager. Same set, same model, just not technically it's the Yellowstone class. Yeah, different class. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Get nitpicky with me, why don't you? Hey, it's Voyager. I like Voyager. <laughs> Although the set was intended for use in Deep Space Nine, uh, it was never used again to depict the runabout's interior, and that's actually quite a shame. I wonder how long they waited before they said, yeah, just tear it down. Because it I'm sure it wasn't built onto the end of the other set, so no. you know, the, you're going to need a new ship of the week, so they're going to probably have to take it down. That. I'm sure they used it for other ships or other rooms uh, in a ship. They, they, they would have redressed it for sure. Annoying, though, because it was good. It was a good, it was a good yeah. interior, but we'll talk about it later on. In the season six episode, Change of Heart, we see a runabout traversing an asteroid field. 
then landed on a planet. Uh, this was the first episode in which a runabout sequence was done only using CGI, and the CGI runabout was developed by the effects company Digital Muse. Okay, so discussion time. Let's talk a little about this minivan of the Star Trek universe, <laughs> the runabout. <laughs> I really like the runabouts. Um, I got to admit, when I was younger, my initial reaction to them wasn't the best. I thought they were kind of clunky and they weren't shuttle-like enough for me. But they soon became one of my favorite ships. I much prefer the looks of them uh, with the additional sensor uh, roll bar, however, as this makes the ship look and feel stockier and makes yeah. it just look so much better. More capable. Yeah. This is probably one of the Star Trek ships that I would most like to have as a personal craft if I could choose one. Um, in today's world, I guess. <laughs> uh, the only thing I think I would add uh, would be a small closet-sized holodeck. Well, maybe a little bit bigger than a closet. Uh, I guess it'd be called a hall suite then, as the suites are a little bit smaller. So, And I don't want to hear any jokes about coming out of the closet-sized holodeck either. So just, shh, guys, be quiet. <laughs> but seriously, uh, the design of this ship is absolutely awesome. Nice size, not too big, not too small. Plus, the ability to swap out modules mm. and add the roll bar makes this a really great, versatile Starfleet ship. So, and just touch on the holodeck idea. Well, just you know, re remodel at the the end compartment with the uh, with the big dining room. That's a pretty decent space. Make it holodeck, and suddenly, boom, you can have your own, you know, custom tables, custom everything. I mean, I'm that's sure... brilliant. Just have the whole back end be a holodeck, and yeah, you can configure it any way you want. Um, anyway, the runabout. It's a strange vessel, um, and personally, I'd always considered it the largest of the shuttles, um, and that's what they always seem to me, just long-range shuttles. Um, Design-wise, though, I, I like it. Simple yet detailed. It's got all the familiar Star Trek elements, um, yet new ones I like, and I really love the idea of this revolutionary new warp core design, which is new on the top. Uh, really clever. And it is, it is a clever ship, and despite my annoyance at them when I first saw DS9, I mean, I never wanted a show about an alien space station. Um, just sort of staying in one place. It's, mm. um, and it seemed to me that having these little shuttle-esque ships to be the only Federation support ship that this space station had was stupid. Um, and did in no way make up for the lack of a starship. Thank God when the Defiant arrived. Um, but anyway, once I moved past my initial impression of them, I think they're a great, sturdy, and quite realistic evolution design. I like the cockpit, the integrated uh, transporter, the aft section, and I really loved seeing all the extra space in the TNG episode, because you never got to see the full interior, and that was the one you just got to enjoy. Um, yeah, overall, a great design. Yeah, now, for what I don't like, I have to say it'd be the lack of a holodeck or holo suite. I mean, we just talked about that, but yeah. Uh, I guess as well as the sleeping bunks, they just don't look very comfortable to me. Plus, there's not really much privacy. Well, the rear mean, part of the ship is awesome, but it's a real shame that it wasn't seen more. Although, I would probably redesign it to have a little more, a little different kind of sleeping compartments or maybe sleeping compartments on one side, a little hollow well, suite on the is other. Is there space for a sonic shower anywhere? Because they don't talk about the no. TNG, but it's a, it's a Voyager staple. So how are they? Is there a bathroom? Don't know. That's a good question. That's it's always a Star Trek question. Is uh, there a bathroom? I'm sure there are plans next to us, so we'll be, we'll be able to look, we'll be able to see. But uh, you need a sonic shower somewhere, guys, because you know the the. Well, the no, you don't need a sonic shower. All you do is just step in the transporter pad, beam yourself <laughs> off, beam yourself back without the dirt. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, the only major beef I have with the actual design of the ship was probably the way the uh, nacelle attachment points look, especially from the front. It's kind of that semicircle look. I think uh, some of Rick's earlier design ideas would have been better and I would prefer those in the final product but yeah I think that's about it a very cool ship and something that to be honest really it's hard to find many flaws with it so <laughs> I was kind of scrounging for something to say there <laughs> which is what we have to do a lot of the time um yeah. I actually quite like the impulse I like how they're integrated I think that's a nice nice way it's cool the way they're integrated yeah but I don't like that rounded look I think it should have been more like an angular angular kind of look okay. yeah. personally what I don't like, um, I don't like that it's obviously meant to be this larger ship meant for longer missions with, you know, rooms back there, but we only ever got to see the cockpit, hence why I always think of it as a shuttle, um, and that's how they only seem to use it. I mean, we always see in Voyager and in TNG just the cockpit and flying around. That's how they did in DS9, so it's always had that same feel to me um, until we did the research and whatnot. Um, I wanted to see more of the internal space. They really, really missed a beat, and that's why I said it was so rewarding to see the TNG episode um, actually proving the ship was capable, a capable starship rather than just flying from A to B. 
you, you know, you, it was a true platform for doing the science and doing the t really good. Um, I don't like, we never got a sense of the real, uh, an extra functionality. Come on, it's removable pods. I know it would have meant, you know, building new sets time after time when they keep changing it, but imagine if they had done that. It would have truly been the uh, Thunderbirds 2 of the Starfleet universe, Star Trek universe. Um, and I would have been just fine with that because different missions, different things, I could have done so much with that. Um, basically, I like this design, but not really how it was used. Nowhere near its potential. Um, and although that said, another little thing um, is that, come on, we saw the runabout destroy way too many ships way too easily. I'm sorry, but it should not be able to rip through a Dominion bug ship like butter. Overpowered. I know it's just for the scene, for the shot, but if you start, you know, showing these ships taking out things willingly, then it just, whatever. Yeah, but the, the, the bug ships are like the TIE fighters of the Star Trek universe. Are they, though? They're made I mean, to be it, fodder. Yeah. Star Trek's always weird with the, the, the power of the weapons sometimes. But, still, great ship. Well done, Rick. I look forward to speaking to you about the actual designing element at a later date. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, that's it, guys. If you need to go do some running about... Ah, see what I did there? I'm not, I'm not. Oh, I'll wait for the end of the script. Wait, wait a second. Yeah, okay. uh, and you need to get some errands done. Now would be the time because we are finished for today. Too bad you can't take the Trek equivalent of the minivan out for a spin. As Unless you, you own a minivan. <laughs> that's not the Star Trek equivalent of the minivan, though. No. Well, I'll just call it runabout and give it a little roll bar. No, it's not as good. <laughs> Okay. Um, but that, I'm sure, would speed things up immensely to do that. Um, also, please click the like button, and don't forget to subscribe to become a Trek Yards crew member. Also, if you want to be more than a regular crewman and actually become an officer and help us produce the show, Get some pips. You, should Very important. Consider, you should consider visiting the Patreon page and donating to the show to help us out. Uh, or head on over to trekyards.com and click the PayPal donate button to do a one-time donation. While there, you can also check out all of our past episodes until we fill your screens with our awesome faces again. Until then, this is Captain Foley. And Commander Collins. Now go. Run about. Like crazy people. Just don't fall.